Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to, to the IRF Young Professional Summit. Uh, thanks for attending today's event from, from all over the world. We have received registration literally from, from many, many, many parts of the world. So I'm Gonzalo Caras. I will be your host today. Um, besides being the IRF Young Professionals Lead, I'm also responsible for all the membership and, and innovation activities at the International Road Federation here in Geneva. And uh, our Director General, Susana Samatar, is also here with us. So I give now the floor to her to say a few welcoming words. Susana. Thank you, Gonzalo, and a very warm welcome to uh, all of you on behalf of the International Road Federation and also my personal behalf. I can't tell you how pleased I am today to see this uh, happening. And I want to immediately uh, take uh, two minutes to thank uh, the teams from IRF and from uh, yours, the Youth for Road Safety, who have worked on, uh, on putting this event together and, and as well to Gonzalo, who has been leading uh, this entire process. Let me say two words about the International Road Federations, because uh, probably there are some of you who are just joining us for the very first uh, time. We are an independent, uh, not-for-profit uh, organization uh, based uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, but operating uh, globally all over the, the world. Our membership, we are a membership-based federation. Our membership spans from uh, private sector companies, big multinationals, but also uh, smaller businesses from around the world, but also public uh, sector ministries, uh, road agencies, and uh, together with uh, research and, uh, and academia. Uh, we have been assisting the sector for about uh, 72 years now and um, shaping a number of activities around three main strategic pillars that you see displayed uh, here on the slide. Knowledge sharing uh, and uh, knowledge and information sharing and dissemination, building people, uh, bringing people together, really connecting uh, people, businesses and, and ideas, just like we're doing uh, today. And last but not least, uh, a lot of work on the policy and uh, advocacy. The IRF Young Professional Program, I have to say, personally, it's very, very close uh, to my heart because I personally, personally initiated uh, this, uh, this program some, some time ago to really offer a platform for the next generation of, of leaders, many of you are on the line uh, today, a platform to share ideas, to connect, and ultimately to, uh, to grow. And I can assure you that the entire leadership of, uh, of IRF uh, and all our membership stand behind the idea that our young people ought to be the priority as Zoleka Mandela power, very powerfully said uh, just a few days ago during the UN General Assembly. And we need to make sure that your voices, the voices of young people are Heard. And that's why we are here today with this event. So thank you for joining us. A few days ago, I had the immense pleasure of hosting uh, Florent Menegot, who is the CEO of uh, Michelin, for our very first uh, IRF executive uh, talks. And when I asked him specifically a question about the young generation and asked him to give an advice uh, to the young people out there listening uh, to us, he told uh, a very simple, powerful sentence. Believe in yourself. And I want to echo his message today. Believe in yourself and believe in your ideas. And you can count on us because IRF believes in you and we believe in your ideas and we will make our utmost to be able to support you in your journey. So I wish you a very productive uh, discussion today. And uh, I already look forward to the opportunity to uh, reconnect and work again in the future. Thank you, Gonzalo, back to you. Anna, uh, I know I know you have a, a lot of commitment to this program, so thank you for your support. Um, about uh, some some formalities here, uh, if you if you intend to get involved and, and apply to the IRF program, there are basically some some requirements to comply with. So you have to be between 22 and 35 years old. Uh, you have to be somehow connected to the road and mobility sector, uh, either as a student or as a as a young professional. And we are looking for people that is very proactive and, and has demonstrated some level of leadership skills to grow further. So if you are interested in this, uh, just write us an email to youngpp at irfnet.ch and we will follow up there directly based on your uh, personal situation. I know many of you already wrote us during last week, so thanks for that and we will, we will definitely follow up. Now, let me just uh, move forward and, and present quickly the agenda for today. 
Uh, first, we will have a, a panel on, on the youth coalition for road safety led by our partner, yours, as anticipated by, by Susanna. Uh, follow, up, follow up by a, a number of speakers from our own IRF Young Professional Program. And finally, we will enter in, in the world of startups and, and entrepreneurship. So you will have to, uh, you will have the possibility to get somehow inspired of, of these cases of success. Now, uh, without further ado, let's uh, start with the, with the, the first part in the agenda, uh, with the help of Maolin, who will lead the panel discussion on the Youth Coalition for Road Safety. Uh, Maolin is indeed a, a Youth Advisory Board member for the Global Youth Coalition for Road Safety and has uh, recently been accepted into the Youth Delegate Program, where she will represent the United 2030 community in efforts to achieve uh, global growth through youth initiatives and mobilization. So Maolin, uh, the stage uh, is, is, is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, good day, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm really happy to be part of, to be leading this panel, and there are some really interesting people ahead. So, uh, so buckle up for a really interesting conversation. So before I begin, I'm going to share my screen. So here we go. There. First, we have an introduction to the Youth for Road Safety are yours. So as, as, as was mentioned earlier, we, are, we have partnered with the IRF to bring you uh, this very, very interesting summit. And I would like to present, start this uh, presentation with some facts about road safety. So first of all, annually, the, the number for total road-related deaths and injuries come to over 1.2 million worldwide. One third of this number are from young people aged 15 to 29 years old. So if we break that down in a year, over 350,000 young people die every year. If you break that down daily, over close to 1,000 young people are losing their lives on the roads. So this is very alarming. These are young people with dreams, with goals, with passions, and they are they are losing their lives and their dreams and their opportunities on the, the roads. And we at the Youth for Road Safety and the Global Youth Coalition believe that it's about time that we start acting on this issue. So where, so where does yours come in? Yours is a nonprofit organization that seeks, that engages and empowers youth to become road safety leaders and activists. Yours connects with youth, mobilizing and training them to be road safety leaders and advocates in their respective communities. So here are some of the so here are some of the projects of yours. These are interactive workshops. Uh, so this is from Iceland. Um, so the capacity development training for young leaders. Yours has workshops designed to empower young people to take evidence-based road safety actions and put youth at the center of the division, decision making table on road safety decisions that affect their lives. So we've gone we've gone global. So. Right here are some of the sessions we have uh, here in Belize and the first one in Iceland. So the Yours workshops are very interactive. It uses music, art, expression, role play, and other real life demonstrations. This gives youth a unique insight into the world of road safety and sustainable mobility. And ever since Yours was created, it has worked hard to provide young people with opportunities to grow, connect, and learn. One of these opportunities happened earlier this year in the form of the, globe, of the second World Youth Assembly for Road Safety. It was held in Stockholm, Sweden. So true to the goals of the Youth for Road Safety, yours, the second World Youth Assembly was led by youth. It was youth driven from a task force that comes from, from young people all over the world. Yours gathered this group of young people from different parts of the world with different expertise, all all connected to road safety. The WYA assembly gathered youth and other road safety advocates from all over the world and gave them the opportunity to connect and learn about road, road related issues and solutions from different perspectives in different regions and from a, multitude, from a multitude of sectors. So here we have some of the members during the assembly. So the assembly had two significant outputs. First, is the Global Youth Statement for Road Safety. The Global Youth Statement for Road Safety presents a list of demands and commitments of the youth presented to global leaders and decision makers, calling them to address global road safety issues by engaging and connecting with youth, by giving them a place at the decision-making table. 
That's the first output. The second output is the Global Youth Coalition for Road Safety. How did we get here? So what's the story behind the Global Youth Coalition for Road Safety? How did it happen? Of the 160 plus youth delegates from the 74 countries, all of the delegates agreed that uh, they, wanted, they wanted to be part of the coalition, uh, that a coalition for road safety that can, that can take their concerted efforts and build their skills and allow them to stay in touch make connections and exchange knowledge and experiences with other leaders interested in the same field. The coalition unites individual youth and different youth-led orga youth organizations in an informal member-based structures guided by key principles with focus on meaningful youth participation and safe mobility. So these are our principles, global advocacy, local actions, and support structure. These will be key and important factors in our goals to achieve 50 by 30, which is target SDG target 3.6, having the number of road-related deaths and injuries by the year 2030. So what is our main goal? The main goal of the coalition is to energize the global youth movement for road safety that contributes in saving lives and reducing fatalities. We at yours and the Global Youth Coalition believe that youth have the capacity to energize the global road safety movement. And for that, we are, we believe, we strongly believe that youth are key players in making this goal a reality. So as I mentioned, here are the two goals of the coalition. But apart from these two goals, which is target 3.6, having the number of road-related deaths by the year 2030, and target 11.2, providing access to safe, sustainable, affordable, accessible transport systems for all, we also have uh, targets related to SDG 3, health, SDG 4, education, SDG 10, reduced inequalities, SDG 11, sustainable cities, and SDG 13, climate action. So all of, the, all of these targets and goals encompass the road safety field. So yes, the coalition is led by the youth. So the, the, the youth advisory board. These are the then uh, global youth task force members turned uh, global uh, youth advisory board. The focal, the youth advisory board. The Youth Advisory Board will be the focal points and the engine of the Youth Coalition for Road Safety. Youth will have the opportunity to weigh in directly on how the local actions and the global advocacy strategies are run. So that's what we need. So, okay, before I, end this, uh, before I end this little introduction, I would like to invite everyone who, who are interested in joining the road safety movement to connect with us by visiting www.claimingourspace.org. If you know anyone who is interested or is or who wants to be involved with road safety, please connect with us, join us. We are very active on our social media pages. You have that down below. And we would very much like to get to know everyone and get uh, and start working on reducing the number of road-related deaths and injuries by year 2030. So that's, uh, that's the little introduction we have. So now I would like to present uh, the amazing panelists I have for this session for the yours panel. So I would like to introduce them briefly and I would like them to give a little short, uh, short message before I proceed to the next speaker. So first we have Bashiru Mansarai. So Bashiru is a tech social entrepreneur. He founded Open Space Corporation or OS Corp in Sierra Leone. OS Corp is a tech company that helps young people start their own enterprise by providing a way to easily re register startups, access to technological tools, resources, and networks. So OS Corp also provides a platform which supports young entrepreneurs, therefore solving the problem of a lack of infrastructure and support for startups in Sierra Leone. So Bashiru, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Say hi to the people. Um, everyone, my name is Bashir Mansiri, I'm the founder of OS Corp. So I think Maureen just said everything that I need to be said. I don't want to match them to do yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay, up next we have Allison Collard de Buford. Allison is a road safety advocate and, is, and is the founder and executive director of, Vision Zero, of the Vision Zero Youth Council. The Youth Council is a fully youth led organization that educates youth on traffic safety and empowers them to become vocal activists for safer streets and engages them in working with local schools, nonprofits, and elected officials to reach their traffic safety goals. So, Allison, would you like to say a little something? Hi guys, um, I think you covered everything now, thank you. <laughs> yeah, 
So, okay. Up next, uh, up next, last but not least, we have Tom Wine Hosea. So, Hosea currently works as an uh, as a national representative for restless development at the AIDS SRHR Alliance Uganda, is a Western Regional Representative under the National Youth Engagement Network, and a fellow under Teach for Uganda and a Community Development Officer at the Resilient Women's Organization. So hi there, Tamwine. Are you there? Okay, I think his microphone is a little is off. Hey. So, okay. Hey, my. How are you? Okay, doing good. Okay, so everyone, before we start. To... Okay, okay. So everyone, before we start, if you have any questions you want to ask our panelists, the chat room is open. You can send in your questions there, where my 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 colleague from yours, Miss Raquel Barrios, will take the questions, and uh, and if we and we will be uh, we will be asking them to our panelists a little later on. So I think we should kick this kick the discussion off. So for the panelists, my panelists, I, my first question is about the COVID-19 pandemic. So the COVID-19 pandemic has hit us the youth hard. It hasn't just affected our daily routines, it has also affected our work, studies, and opportunities to, con to continue different projects. The three of you have developed or worked under great employability models within your field and interest. So could you share your experience on developing or finding employment opportunities for youth, for youth, for yourself and for youth in general? So apart from that, how do you think youth advocacy, participation and commitments can continue with their tasks and commitments despite global restrictions? So I think I'll start with Allison. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I think that's a very, very relevant question, and it's important that we um, discuss it because, it, again, as you said, it, in, it impacts all of us. Um, and the Vision Zero Youth Council's model is based off of networking with our peers, with um, young professionals in the field, um, anyone who is involved or could be involved in road safety advocacy. Um, we try to create partnerships with them straight from the beginning. So that creates these relationships between youth and these employment opportunities, um, which we then um, throughout time um, become like have, a, have an easier access to because we're connected and we have this already uh, grown network of um, our peers that we can work with. Um, and as for your second question about um, adapting to these global restrictions, I think the whole world has adapted pretty well to a remote model and especially coming from the United States where um, we've adapted to life with COVID. Um, our, like, we, can't, we can't travel, we can't really do much in terms of um, meeting with others, but in my opinion, that just means that we can take that energy and instead put, put it towards fighting even harder. Um, and we have these wonderful webinars and online events to just keep the movement going, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Allison. I particularly like the, the part where you said that we should take this opportunity to, to gather that energy so that we can, we can use it for fighting the good fight. So thank you very much for sharing, sharing your answer with us. So same question, I'm passing it on to Bashiru. Um, hello, everyone again. Um, so regarding the, the question in terms of job op opportunity, that has been one thing that's really disturbing people here in Sierra Leone because um, the, the job opportunity here is like one of the, the, the biggest issue, of, um, especially young people are facing here. So um, I'm one of the people that actually were looking for job, but I couldn't get it because of the, you know, the huge line and, and sometimes you need to know other people before you can get into um, 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 the job. So what I, I decided is that why, why don't I create my own um, um, company, even if it's a startup, so that I can at least employ myself and then employ other people. But as uh, 
as I keep going, I, I realize that I, um, the number of people I can employ is very limited. Like, for example, it's a startup. I can't employ more than 10 people, yeah? So um, I started thinking on how I can expand or how I can support other um, um, entrepreneurs or, other, or create other things that will employ more young people. And then um, we, we shift off because we were just focused on creating um, um, tech tools, but now we include entrepreneurship into our, our um, company, wherein we, we, we don't just create um, technological tools or software, but we also provide entrepreneurship support and uh, we build platforms like the OS Hub, um, um, which um, um, Maulin, you saw that um, I was featured in some of these blogs. Um, so OS Hub is practically help young people that have their own businesses so that they can use it for free to manage their businesses, create projects, um, job, um, provide jobs to other people. So basically, we, we, we came from creating jobs to support other entrepreneurs also to create more jobs because we know that's really needed. And for the second question relating to the restrictions, um, I think that's why um, um, we came out with OS Hub because a lot of people, um, especially those startups, they, they tell us, well, we have to close down our company because now there, there are so many restrictions, you know, um, um, people can't come to work or we, um, they have been asked for us to lock down or these things. So that's why we, we actually created OS Hub because OS Hub is like a virtual workspace. Um, you use it to work remotely with your, 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 your coworkers and also people, clients can go there and look for businesses that they can buy stuff from or connect with or entrepreneurs can connect with other entrepreneurs. Um, we have a lot of tools there, but OS Hub is mainly because of this COVID-19. So that's why we created OS Hub so that people will not be restricted, um, even if they are being restricted for not going to places, but they can still work while working from home or anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bashiru. I think that's a really, really interesting story of how OS Corp came to be. The story of how you couldn't find work so that you created one is a perfect, perfect solution to the problem and you did not only help yourself but you also helped others who have been struggling with the same problem so that's really that really shows the ingenuity and the creativity of youth so i would like to offer tom wine the same question so uh tom wine can you uh what do you think what do you think of uh, of the covid19 pandemic and how it affects the youth our opportunities and uh the employment that you're currently under Um, you're on mute if you're if you're speaking. Okay, I think I think Tom Wine has cut out. So uh, maybe if he comes back, he can answer the question. But for now, I would like to ask uh, my my colleague Raquel if we have any any questions from our audiences. Uh, do we have any questions right now? And if if we don't have any, I think we can proceed with the second question so that we can just work our way to what we have. So uh, if it's okay with you, Allison and Bashiru, we can start with the second question. Is, is that okay? Okay, cool. So, okay. So the second question is from the perspective of road safety. Uh, since I have been working closely with uh, road safety groups and individuals, I have learned that road safety and sustainable mobility encompasses a lot of other fields. And apart from the obvious impacts in life, it also encompasses the global goal, the global goals. And as I mentioned, those are included in, uh, in SDG 3, 4, uh, 10, uh, 11, and 13. So my question to the panelists are, how do you think safe roads and sustainable mobility affect the progress and development in your field? And how does it affect uh, the leaders you're working with and the opportunities that your, uh, that your group or organization wants to put forward? So first, I think we can go with uh, Allison again. Um, so as you say, as you said, road safety encompasses a whole wide variety of major global issues and sustainable mo mobility is interconnected with these issues and thus it's effect it's hard to not be affected by these um, whether directly or indirectly 
So for example, as youth, it can affect our access to education. It can affect our access to job opportunities as we were um, discussing earlier, which is even um, more, uh, it's a bigger concern nowadays with coming out of COVID-19. Um, and it affects our health, like air quality and individual movement. Um, and how it affects each of us isn't like a one size fits all. It's very um, dependent on um, an individual's situation and where they live or where they're from and things like that. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's one certain um, definition of how it affects progress and development, but it's clear that it does to a very, very um, high level. So thank you, Allison. I just want to check if Tom Wine is with us right now. Uh, Tom Wine, are you there? Okay, yeah. I think he's okay. Hello. Hello. Can you hello? Can you hear us properly? Yeah, can you hear you now, Makasha? Okay. Yes. Awesome. My, so, my network had gone. Okay. My network had so, gone, but I'm now on. Okay. Amazing. So we 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 proceeded to the second question, where Allison where Allison just shared how uh, the COVID pandemic, I mean the road safety road safety and sustainable mobility, uh, is involved with other fields, including that uh, including uh, climate like cleaner air and and our health and the rest of the rest of the regular that everyone does. So for you, I think we should go back with the first question about how the COVID-19 pandemic has, yes. affected your, yeah, has affected your experience with employment and uh, how it affects the advocacy, the participation and commitments of your group. So if you want, you can share, share the answer with us. Okay, sorry, sorry for the interruption. So uh, I'm very happy for the fellow panelists and the members here. My name is Tumena Hosea, and I'm from Uganda. Well, uh, for me and my fellow advocates in the field of SRHL, uh, the pandemic has been of a great advantage to us. We've seen ourselves embracing the, the importance of technology. Uh, I can tell you people, social media is a very great thing. Social media is powerful. Social media is unavoidable. We've seen ourselves taking more spaces than we used to, to do actually, reaching out to, to more young people in these spaces. So I, I want to tell us members that we, as, as young people, we need to take advantage of technology. We need to know how much we are, how much we are writing. We need to know how much we are reading. So as, as, as resilient women's organization, the pandemic helped us to to come the first information on, on Facebook regarding COVID-19. And this is, this is the very thing that we are still telling young people. Let's use social media to come first information. Secondly, uh, as young people, this has been an advantage for us actually in Africa to, to, to embrace innovation in terms of agriculture, in terms of technology. I will give, a, I will give an example of my mother who is in village. This is the only time that he, she asked me how she can sell her tomatoes online using Facebook. This is something that she had never dreamt about. So technology have been of very great importance to us and we attribute it to COVID-19. Then secondly, it has been of a disadvantage the other side. We've, we've seen our young people uh, that we address in terms of social production, health and rights. It has been a disadvantage that we have now more young people who are getting pregnant and who are now getting into early marriages because we can't reach to them successfully that, like we used to be. However much, we are still also using Facebook, using social media platforms to keep on advocating, to keep on pushing for policies that work well for young people. So again, uh, I, don't know how much, I don't know how much I can thank our government here for, for embracing technology, however much with the restrictions of paying OTT tax, I don't know how it is that side. And even the network, you can see me moving around up and down looking for network. Because in deeper villages, this network is not there. In deeper villages, these people don't have televisions. In deeper villages, there are no radio stations. And so how do we reach out to these young people? 
this is why I am in this area. This area is called Nawanguku, is in inside the Entebbe district. These young people actually don't even know what COVID means to them. They don't even know what a mask means to them. I think this has been a wake up call to the government to think about people who are in rural areas. How can they really be helped? Thank you very much, Mao. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really insightful. And again, it's really interesting how, how your organization is taking advantage of social media during this time of the pandemic, where it's very hard for everyone to connect. So we are connect physically, so we are connecting digitally. And although it has some benefits, like reaching wider audiences, it does have some drawbacks. Uh, I would say that it does not quite uh, give give the same results as when you're speaking face to face but it's it's still a good it's still a good way to start so thank you for that tom wine so i think we should go back to the second question now and uh get bashiru's answer about how uh safe roads and sustainable mobility affect his field and the leaders that he works with so bashiru uh handing it over to you okay um so because we are a tech company and uh, most of our services uh, okay because we are a tech company and most of our services i think all of our services actually is um, we get, we it's being powered by um, 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 by the cloud so it, they are soft services actually so not not physical so there is no need for like transportation and all of that but when it comes to the people we work with um, um, those other entrepreneurs especially in the um, um, production side food and and uh, I think um, there comes the, the, the needs of road safety um, like for, it comes in two ways, those in the, in, the, in, the, in the rural areas, I mean in the villages, and those also in the city. So for those in the, in the villages, the ones who come with their, their product, like their fruits, um, um, their vegetables to the city to sell, but also if we don't have good roads, that affects them a lot. It affects them in two ways. One, which is um, um, the pricing, because they have to pay um, double or more expensive transportation. Um, to get to where they, they actually want to sell their products. And um, sometimes also, which is the, the second um, problem, sometimes these, they, they, they end up, you know, crashing down the road or something might happen or, you know, um, because of these potholes and all of that, the, 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 their products might fall down, break, or something might happen to it. So that's one of the, the that's the thing that really um, hurts him the people from the, the villages in terms of the road safety and also for people in the city because there are things that comes from and um, we need here that, that are being exported that we can we, we don't um, um, produce them from um, Sierra Leone so um, these exported things comes um, first to the cities and then they take it and migrate them to the villages so the same issue that I just mentioned that affects the people from the village affects them also that makes their, um, their, their products to go to the village really expensive. That's why we, we don't have a stable price here. Even if it's a short distance, like from the city to one town, you might see the, the difference in pricing is huge because of you know the problem they have with road safety. And uh, just like the, the road safety for us here, um, within the, the during COVID-19, we, we were a little bit affected company we have been using like this um, 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 virtual means of communications and all of that but for our um, you know the people we work with the other entrepreneurs they have been affected so I think road safety is something that we really need when it comes to our, our, our clients and what, what, what are the measures that we're trying to put in place um, we are working on coming up with an um, an e-commerce platform, a multi-vendor online platform, just like um, eBay and all of this for people in the rural areas and also here in the city so that when someone needs a product, they can just go online and order for it. And we can take care of the, 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 the shipments, you know, so because we will, we will partner with other um, um, road transportation agencies and uh, in, in our own ways, we'll be able to limit the, the expenditure you know, the, the, the money they pay or the amount of fee they pay for the transportation. So I think that's one of the, the things we are trying to do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Bashiru. I think that's really interesting. It's a really, it's a real life application of what road safety means for people, especially who those who live in low to middle income countries, because you need good roads in order to get food, in order to get resources, to get materials. If 
if the roads are not safe, if they are faulty, if they are problematic, that could cause problems for people getting their materials, their resources, and it can cost them a lot more money if they want to ensure safe travels or travel at all. Sometimes safety isn't even insured. So we really need to address this. Um, thank you, thank you for sharing. So I just wanna make sure if Tom Wine is still here to answer the second question. So Tom Wine, are you there? Uh, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Okay, so I think. Hello. Hello. Hello, Maxan. Hello, are you there? Are you okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I would just Can like to pass on. Yes. Can you hear us? Ah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hello. Mm. Hello. Hello. Hello, Maxai. Okay, can you hear us? Yes, you can hear me. Yes. Okay, so I just like oh, to my pass. God. I would just like to pass the second question on to you about how uh, road safety and sustainable mobility affect your field. Uh, how how do you think road safety affects the progress of development and uh, how it affects the people you are working with? Okay, so I think we're having a little, a little bit, a little problem. So we might just uh, skip over and wait until his connection comes back on. So we have some questions from our audiences. So we have one for Allison. So uh, Allison, the question is, do you think there are any lessons we can learn from COVID-19 and the initial lockdowns in terms of sustainable mobility? Absolutely. I mean, I live in New York City. So when the pandemic first started, we saw an incredible shift from, um, I mean, New York City is a city that never sleeps. So we saw this huge shift from people who were constantly moving, constantly outside, constantly doing things to no one on the streets, to the highways pretty much empty, um, to the streets pretty much empty. And it, I think it kind of gave um, individuals, but also our local governments, uh, time to reflect on how our space is being used throughout the city. And um, coming out of those couple of months where um, we were hit with the pandemic pretty hard, we have implemented a very like a variety of um, transformations throughout the city to try to adapt. Um, and to learn from uh, the observations that we made during the pandemic. So for example, some of the um, parking spaces on the street, because now there are less cars and the city is less crowded, those parking spaces are now being used for restaurants and for cafes and for people to just be able to sit outside um, and have more space and to social distance as well. Um, and the same thing for roads and um, highways, a lot of uh, urban planners and city planners have um, been discussing uh, the fact that when no one has the ability to move anymore, there are thousands and thousands of miles of road that are going unused and that there are definitely um, more sustainable and healthier ways for us to use that space. Um, the question is just how, but um, it's clear that the, the pandemic has highlighted um, these drastic differences in our society and how we can um, move forward in a more efficient manner. Okay, so thank you very much. It's really interesting because as we know, the United States is, has a lot of, is very, uh, is, has lots of vehicles because it's a developed country. So it's really interesting to see how they're utilizing the spaces, how, how they're taking this pandemic as a, as a challenge to address these issues that we have experienced throughout, throughout our lives. So thank you. So I think I have a question for myself. I have a question for me, for the coalition. Uh, so this is the question. In South Africa, the funding for road safety is limited and is more focused in privileged communities. How can the Road Safety Coalition assist organizations here to enable inclusive road safety funding opportunities into these communities and, and unblock interventions? 
So, okay. So we have a lot. First of all, we we want to. So this is an issue if you're how we how we can help vulnerable communities such as the youth. So we first begin by providing training and capacity development opportunities, resources for the youth. So they are equipped with the knowledge necessary to take a stand on these issues. Um, we also have, uh, we have the global youth statement, which we presented uh, during, the, during, the, uh, during the ministerial conference that calls on global leaders uh, to help to start including youth in road safety efforts. But more than this, we have projects that have to do with global and local actions. We are inviting, we are inviting our members to submit projects, any, any suggestions they want if they need seed funding from the coalition. So as long as they present it, they present it in a way that is uh, evidence-based and, uh, and can be, and is very feasible. So if you, if you, the youth want help with, uh, with the community, uh, with the projects regarding road safety, the first thing to do is connect with us, is to get educated, uh, learn about the issue. Why do you think, why do you say that this particular system in your specific community favors this specific group and see what, what they need in order to start taking this, the issue on road safety more seriously. And from there, we will help however we can and we will help however we can. So, okay, okay. I think that's it. If you want to learn more, you can visit our website and connect with us, ask us some questions, and we'll be very happy to answer them all. So, okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. And now we have a, a question for Bashiru. So here's the question. How did your agency er, address the mobility issue in your locality? Because you mentioned that, uh, you, that the OS Corp can handle some requests and you will provide the issue with shipping and if they can if they are not able to do it themselves so the question for you is how how do you an address the mobility issue uh bashiru are you there yeah sorry sorry i was okay. trying to unmute myself then i okay the video. Um, <laughs> it's okay yeah so actually in terms of the 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 commerce side the e-commerce side it's not on os hub that's something we are developing like i said we are trying to come up with um, um, a platform to address that there are a lot of um road um, transport agencies here that i think can handle these things and um, um so what the 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 these these um, um, entrepreneurs or, or business people have to do, we will connect them with these road transport agencies. So they will just have to, you know, package their, their product well and then take it to um, um, these um, road tra transport agencies and then they will come with it in our facility. So we will have like a um, 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 few of their, 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 their products in our something like a warehouse or something or any um, um, facility we, we produce. So like when someone order for a products they don't have to wait until um, this business person take it from the province and come with with, with it all the way that will take a lot lot of time and the, the safety of it is not even guaranteed so they, we will only um, um, put on our platform the products that are already available within our um, facilities so that it can be easily accessible just like eBay and, uh, or Amazon does. So that's something we are trying to replicate, but it's still in an idea stage for now, to be honest. Um, it's still in an idea stage. We are working on, on, on it for now, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's, a, that's an interesting point that it's nice that it, is, it hasn't been perfected, but the good thing is that it's starting. That's, that's, that's the best thing to do as of the moment because there are restrictions. So uh, if you remember during Gonzalo's breakdown of the session, we, uh, we only run up till 2.50. So we're nearly done with the session, but I think I would like to ask the, our two remaining panelists something about uh, their their line of works, uh, but something that connects with the both of them. So Allison founded uh, Vision Zero and uh, the Vision Zero Youth Council and Bashiru OS Corp. So I would just like to ask for youth and other leaders who are interested in starting something that is close to their advocacy, what is your advice on how these people can get started and how and how they can and how their venture can succeed? So I think let's start with Allison. 
That's a really, really good question. And I get asked that a lot because um, everyone that I work with are youth um, looking to do exactly that. Um, and my biggest piece of advice is looking for other youth near you who are um, interested in getting involved as well. And it, they, don't, they don't have to be particularly um, like uh, known. They don't have to know about this issue. Um, but the, the thing that's so amazing about peer-to-peer -peer advocacy is that your, um, your passion for this issue and for trying to solve the issue is going to translate over to them and they're going to feel that passion that you have and they're going to be more inclined to join you and to help you fight the fight. Um, so being, being true to um, your passions and trying to get that support system around you of people who you trust and who you know that you can really grow that local movement and um, build it from the ground up. Um, and then just like network, like reach out to people. Um, social media was mentioned earlier. Social media is a great way to find other youth and um, professionals around you who are involved in the same issue and um, connecting with them to see what exists, what doesn't exist, where um, the holes are, like what you can try to tackle. Um, so doing both will really get you very, very far. Wow, that's a really good advice. I really like how you mentioned uh, the power of peer-to-peer -peer communication when it comes to promoting a, uh, projects like this, because what, what better way to engage youth than if it comes from the youth themselves? So thank you very much, Allison. So uh, Bashir, would you like to share uh, some tips on our, on our, uh, to, for our members and our participants? Yeah, um, so when it comes to starting um, an enterprise or organization or anything else, I think you just have to start it because like most young people, the problem they have is this, like, I don't have everything, I don't have the resources, I don't have, you know, like the office space, I don't have this blah, 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 keep complaining or coming up with things that will actually stop them from not starting. Like for me, I started my, my business while I was working for someone else, um, even though it was just an internship or something like that, because I, I didn't actually have um, um, an actual job. So I was working on my, 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 my startup, um, like a side um, um, project or something and then while I was working on, on someone else's I think you should also try to connect with people that actually know what you're doing because even if you have an idea an idea alone is nothing to be honest nowadays people fancy idea but idea without education is nothing so find people maybe a mentor or or someone that just have the passion that you have in what you're doing, try to collaborate with them. Just like Alison said, um, you, you watch out for people that, you know, they have strength because even if you are the brainstorm of the idea, there are other things you, you're lacking. Like for me, um, sometimes I, get, I become really shy a bit when it comes to new people. So I look out for someone that I know that um, is good at reaching out to people, you know, gathering people. So you look out for like, Try to know your weaknesses and what you're doing first. When you know your weakness, then you look for people that you know that can not just not replace you, but can assist you. And also when they're assisting you, you should try learning from them because they're not going to be there forever because I know everyone have a dream. So you should expect people to leave sometime at a point. So learn from them. And when you know, try to teach other people also. So okay. I think collaboration is one of the, 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 the key things that you can that can help you in, in building anything you want to build and start okay. with whatever you have yeah okay thank you thank you to, thank you so much to our panelists allison bashiru and tom wine for sharing what he shared during the first session so this is where the yours panel ends thank you so much to the amazing panelists we learned a lot and i hope this inspires the audience the participants to get involved and find their passion and just connect with the advocacy and if you want to connect with the global youth coalition you know where to find us www.clavingourspace.org thank you so much everyone that's it for the yours panel so thank you thank you marlene and uh, alison bashiru and tungwine uh, advocacy work is very important for the sector so thank you for that. 
So now that first part is, is over, uh, we need to move to the second part where we're going to hear from, from members of the IRF Young Professionals Program. Uh, I want to just make a, a recall right now. Uh, if you have any questions, just please use the Q&A functionality of Zoom. Uh, we will try to, to reply to you over there. And then I saw around some questions about the recordings. So we will make available all the recordings uh, in the next days. So you will have the possibility to, to watch this fully uh, offline if needed and at, at your own convenience. Now, uh, our, our first speaker for this session is, is Neville. He's a, he's a transport economist with over five, five years of experience in the implementation of development programs in, in transport infrastructure. And, and Neville uh, recently joined the Ministry of Finance in Namibia uh, as a senior economist in the Directorate of Public-Private Partnerships. Happy to have you on board us today, uh, Neville. The, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. Uh, thank you for, there we go. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and I will run you through uh, a short presentation that I've prepared for you this afternoon. Thank you also to the panelists that spoke earlier. Uh, it was a very fruitful um, discussion and, and so much to learn from. Thank you so much. Um, so the intersect of what I'll be speaking about today is a bit of my experience in terms of road infrastructure financing uh, in Africa, you know, looking at whether this is sustainable and um, in terms of affordability, in terms of improving safety and what I have learned from my experience in Namibia. So um, in terms of Africa, the road statistics are actually very, very, um, supportive of the argument that roads are very important to the, to the economies of different countries. Um, they are the drivers of growth in terms of the economy, giving access to um, employment, giving access to jobs, uh, sorry, giving access to employment and job opportunities, and also um, access to markets for rural com communities and, and health and, and business opportunities as well. So some of the figures that you see are that 90% of passenger traffic in Africa is, is carried on the road network. As Neville, well as Neville, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but um, you forgot to, to share your screen. So we, we are not seeing anyone, anything on there. Oh, thank you. Apologies. No worries. Apologies for that. Just a moment. All right. Can we see that? Are we on the same page? Yes, yes, go ahead. Now, now you can see your, your, your slides, yes. Thank you so much. So I will just um, continue there. So as I said, I'm speaking, speaking on road infrastructure funding and the big question that I would like to leave with you at the end of the presentation is, is road infrastructure finance uh, funding sustainable in Africa? And of course, as I said, my experience from Namibia. So just to move forward. So I was saying about 90% of passenger freight is carried on the road network and about 80% of, of, of freight is, is also carried on the road network. Um, about 53% of the general road network in, in, uh, in Africa is unpaved, and only about half of that provides access to, to has access to all season roads. Of course, this has led to significant increases in road fatalities, and um, unfortunately, Namibia has one of the, the highest road fatalities in the world as well. Um, so this is a very critical area and a critical uh, element of, 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 um, road, of the road sector in, in Africa. And this is some of the reasons why uh, transport and particularly road infrastructure sector was an interesting career or, or area for me to, to, to participate in uh, or what motivated me to get into to the road sector. Um, some of the challenges that, that the uh, the road sector in Africa faces are, of course, uh, poor maintenance is, is prevalent. Uh, this is an issue across different countries um, in terms of the skills and capacity that is required to maintain and, and keep the road network in a sustainable state. Um, other issues are, of course, with vehicle overloadings, um, that this is, uh, in some cases, not regulated uh, properly or unregulated. 
and of course uh, the institutional setup of the road network, how the funding models are done and, and, and so forth. But in my experience, um, one of the, the key interest in, of, of the key interest of research in my area is uh, road user fees and road user charges, how those are collected um, in terms of efficiency, in terms of equity, and also uh, private participation in the road sector um, is, 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 is very limited in Africa. There have only been about 10 projects, I believe, I stand under correction, um, where the private sector has participated in whether it is the operations or the construction of the road network. And there is a lot of opportunity there in terms of getting some of those efficiency gains in terms of um, bringing in the innovation, the expertise and the skills of the private sector into uh, the provision of, of road infrastructure. So these two key areas have been the focus of my, my work in, in Namibia. And just to speak a little bit also about the road sector in Namibia, um, Namibia has been voted now for the third time, I believe, by the World Economic, um, the World Economic Forum as having the top roads in top quality roads in Africa. And we have done this and achieved this feat by having a strong road sector institutional framework that you see there on your, on your right hand side. So we have um, institutions such as the Roads Authority and we have the uh, road contractor company which is responsible for constructing the roads uh, effectively with the private sector alongside the private sector and then we have the end users that are responsible for paying the user fees so that they can enjoy uh, the a certain level of service and access to the road network and then the road uh, fund administration is the one responsible for collecting these user fees and then allocating them back to the sector to roads authority as well so um, in the past few years, it is, it is recognized around the world that one of the biggest contributors of road funding, which is the fuel levy, um, continues to be inefficient. Um, this has been a result of the increase in, increase in efficiency of, of uh, vehicles that are now more fuel efficient. Every year, vehicles travel a greater distance, uh, requiring less fuel. So that automatically means that the the revenue that can be collected from this uh, fuel levy is diminishing. On the other hand, of course, if we, as we have seen this year, many governments have been faced by uh, the global pandemic COVID-19 and they are facing uh, competing needs, increasing competing needs where funds that are already scarce have to be allocated to the health sector, have also to be allocated to the education sector, which now is faced with, you know, they have to use um, technologies such as tablets, there's remote learning and, and so forth. So governments have to diverse a bit. So in this scarcity, they still have to um, provide state budget allocations to the road sector. So how do we make sure that the road sector is efficiently funded in order to um, be able to afford the proper level of service uh, safety to meet the safety requirements of users and to provide access to the much needed areas in rural communities in, in, in Africa. Um, this is a very important question and I believe part of the solution would be to bring in the private sector where it is feasible. It might not be uh, feasible in greenfield investment, which is uh, the construction of a brand new road, but it might be feasible in cases such as a brownfield investment where you would bring it out once the government has constructed the road, you would then bring in a private investor to perhaps maintain and construct the road um, on a required service level, and then having some sort of a avail availability payment um, a model. Um, another part of research shows that perhaps vehicle distance charging can be another instrument that can be introduced to, to bridge the gap in, in funding and road financing. Um, with all of these, I believe that this institutional model that you see there uh, does not pave the way forward if young people's voices are not heard and are not involved. Um, young people account for or are projected to account for about 17% of the global population by 2030, according to UN reports. Um, for Africa, it is double the amount that it currently is. Africa's youth population is growing at an exponential rate. So young people account for nearly about a third to 50% of the population in Africa. And I believe that their voice needs to be heard in terms of what are the planning mechanisms, what are the 
decision-making processes. Where should the government invest in the road sector? Uh, what type of safety uh, technology should be used on roads? Where should the roads be constructed? Young people's voices should be heard and, and be involved in that process. Um, thank you very much for listening this afternoon. If you have any follow-up questions for me, or if you'd like to get involved to cooperate perhaps on, on a research or on a project, please don't hesitate to contact me uh, on my Gmail, I believe I've provided, or on LinkedIn, you can find me at Neville Gerisev. Um, thank you so much for listening. And, and over to you, Gonzalo. Thank you, thank you, uh, Neville. I appreciate your, your inputs today and, and being with us to on this event. Uh, I'm, I'm going forward to, for the sake of maintaining a little bit the agenda today. Thanks for that. And uh, our next speaker is, is Lanai. She's a, since an experienced sociologist, researcher, and education method specialist working at the Road Safety Institute, uh, Panos Milonas in Greece. Lanai, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, the, this virtual stage is now uh, yours. Thank you, Gonzalo. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be part of IRF's Young Professional Summit. So my name is Danai Stavro and I'm a trained sociologist, researcher and education method specialist. Uh, we will start by sharing uh, my presentation. And uh, tell me if you can see. Yeah, all good, thanks. Okay, thank you, perfect. So uh, on 2013, RSI, uh, was participating in a national uh, agency in a national program hiring unemployed uh, scientists to work. I was uh, reading uh, the story of the organization, how it started, and all the great work uh, was achieved. And I was very interested to work there and help to its work since uh, the situation in our country is very difficult. Fortunately, I was accepted and an amazing journey started for me. In the beginning, after a short period uh, of training, I was involved in the educational programs department as an instructor for school uh, for primary school students. After the end of this six month uh, period, my collaboration with RSI expanded uh, on a voluntary basis. And in 2017, uh, RSI's president, Ms. Vasiliki Milona, uh, was um, believed in me and my abilities and hired me as permanent staff member to work on the quality assurance and educational programs uh, department. So after that, everything changed for the better. But I would like to say a few words uh, for Road Safety Institute Panos Milonas. RSI is a non-profit organization established in 2005 after the tragic loss of Panos Milonas. Ms. Vasiliki Milona, his mother, transformed him into a creative initiative uh, with a vision of a world without road crashes and a mission to increase society's awareness for the promotion of traffic safety culture. RSI's work is divided into three strategic pillars, which are general policy, driver behavior, and infrastructure. RSI's team of experts working into an interdisciplinary approach according to the recent scientific uh, standards. RSI's work has been acknowledged in national and international level and its credentials are many, as you can see. Under the second pillar, uh, strategic pillar, driver's behavior, are some of the most important activities of RSI. RSI's educational program for all age groups and road users. And it is important to mention that our team had trained more than 220,000 students during the last decade. So in RSI, I have four years of experience as a researcher, administrator, and education method specialist. I manage the administrative issues for several RSI EU projects. I'm dealing with ISO procedures to ensure the quality of all activities. And I'm also responsible working for sales, promotion, and implementation of RSI's educational programs in companies, municipalities, and other organizations. 
by bringing national and international road safety meetings and conferences, it is a great opportunity to learn from other road safety experts, share ideas, as well as gain knowledge that helps to improve the organization's work and also mine. Today, I am actively involved in four EU projects, coordinating them and seeking opportunities for new collaborations and proposals with possible customers and sponsors of ISI. To be a young leader in the sector, you need to set specific and clear goals that lead to a greater outcome and better self-performance. It is important to be focused and to reach results by having a clear vision. I know that this is not an easy task, but it's necessary. Believe in you and your strengths. Develop a belief that says, I'm good enough, I can do this. Then what's to be done is for you to decide to become the best you were born to be. Build your self-confidence by getting involved in projects, committees, and organized events if it's possible. Read books, listen and observe other leaders and don't stop to learn from them. Learning is a lifelong process and is an enjoyable one. Keep learning and keep your mind open to new things and possibilities. Communicate and connect with others. Build strong and meaningful relationships. To be successful at a young age, you have to be responsible and disciplined, but at the same time to be fearless, take risks and trust your instinct to be in the right direction. Never give up and be patient. Success doesn't just happen overnight. Hard work and patience is always a virtue. But besides the above, young people can become excellent leaders if they have the fortune of being encouraged in the right way. A young leader can become better and mature if he has enlightened mentors who can guide him irrespective of the political situations or without meddling. RSI and especially our president, Ms. Vasiliki Milona, believes in young people and is helping them to improve their skills for a better society, giving them opportunities to build a world without road crashes. I would really like to thank Ms. Milona, who was my mentor. And as Samuel Beckett said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And if you have any questions, please feel free to share it with me. Thank you. Thank you, Danai. Um, very, very interesting uh, point of view on, on, on the topics you deal. Uh, it's, it's glad to see how, how the things are, are, are properly managed in, in this way. So thanks for, for being us today. Let's, let's move forward for, for the sake of time as well. Uh, our next speaker is Frederick. He's a senior consultant at Neckermann Strategic Advisors, where he supports companies in understanding how the mobility revolution will change their businesses. Frederick will also share uh, will share some some insights about his work, and also he will lead a, a panel with members of the IRF program. So, Frederick, uh, the screen is now yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Um, let me share my screen with you right now. Okay. So, let's get started. Um, first of all, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. Um, it's a great pleasure to share a bit more about my career path, but as well about the impact of the transportation industry um, on, on our environment. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm Frederick John, and as you can tell, well, I am not from the UK. I'm from Belgium, from the south of Brussels, and I'm a senior consultant and they and strategic advisors. So we are a think tank consulting firm that is based in London, and we look at the um, intelligent uh, mobility and smart city trends. So we offer three services. The first one is um, research practice. Uh, we also do uh, advisory. And finally, we deliver professional public speaking services. So we have written four books since 2015. And the last one is a bit special for me because uh, I'm the co-author of it. And I was really proud when uh, we released it on Amazon you know, to fill in the author page. Uh, so that was a, a good moment for me that I wish to everyone. 
Um, I'm also a guest lecturer at uh, Imperial College London, where I studied an MBA, and also at Regents University, where, well, basically I share some insights about entrepreneurship, innovation, um, and also about, uh, of course, smart mobility and smart city. I'm also a contributor at the World Economic Forum, where I support them with their new mobility working groups. And I'm also a mentor um, of social impact startups from the Shaper Impact Capital, uh, which is a, an impact investor network that is based by the, um, the World Economic Forum. So today I'm here to share a bit more about my, my path that led me to the mobility industry. And well, actually it brings me back to December, 2017. So I was working as a consultant for a very well-known consulting firm that I'm sure everybody knows. And uh, I liked my job actually. I, I really did like what I was doing, but I was addressing challenges, issue, issues, and pursuing objectives that were certainly important, at least for our clients and my company, but a bit far away from what I care about. And I just asked myself, okay, Fred, what's for you the dream job? What's for you the, the ideal job? And I came to the conclusion that it's the combination of what I like to do with what I care about. And today, well, I'm really lucky because uh, my job is addressing the issues that I care about. More generally speaking, um, I care about the sustainability of our world, the sustainability of our environment. But more specifically, um, my job is addressing congestion, pollution, and safety issues. So congestion and pollution issues are important for me because I can tell you that when you live in Brussels, you face every day a high level of pollution and congestion, and perhaps even more than in other uh, European capitals. And um, also safety because safety is important for me because unfortunately, while well, some of my close relatives were involved in um, road accidents. And at some point, well, I just wanted to do something about it. So I'm going to share with you uh, some data about these three issues to show you that there is still a lot of work to do. And I'm sure that um, it will inspire our uh, next speakers for, for the panel. So let's get started with congestion. Around the world, congestion costs every year $500 billion. It's a lot of money. And if we bring um, this to a city level, for example, in London in 2019, the bill was over $13 billion. So it's a lot of money. We could do a lot with it. And if we move now to uh, the pollution, well, the transportation industry is the second biggest greenhouse gas uh, emitter in the world just after the electricity and the heating system. So it is also funny to realize the, the relationships between the electricity industry and the transport industry with the rise of electric vehicles. If you look on the right hand side, unfortunately you can see that we are not going towards the right direction because uh, since 2019, uh, the transport indus industry has the second growth rate in terms of CO2 emissions just after the industry sector. Last but not least, since I have started this speech, over 20, 12 people just died. And if we do nothing about it, by 2030, it's gonna be over 32 for the same amount of time. So now, without transition, I suggest we kick off the panel. Um, if you wanna keep the discussion rolling, just connect with me via email or flash the QR code, you will access my LinkedIn profile. But now I suggest that we welcome our different panelists. So let me hand over the, the screen to Gonzalo again. and. Let's start a panel. So today we will have the, the huge pleasure and the excitement to, to travel around the world. So from Colombia to India, uh, we will learn a lot and get inspired by our panelists. Our first speaker is Jose. He's born and raised in Colombia and is the research and development project manager at Suarcomisa and belongs to its innovation team. So he cur he's currently working on a wide range of European Commission projects such as the Horizon 2020, or the Drive to the Future project that perhaps some of you know. We are also lucky to welcome Bhuvanesh. He is a crash investigator, road safety engineer at GP Research in India. He focuses on helping road builders, government authorities, and other stakeholders in making data-driven decisions on improving road infrastructure. 
The last but certainly not least is Fahim. He is a PhD fellow and university tutor in infrastructure design and road safety at the Department of Mechanical and Construction Engineering at North Bria University in England. So please join me to welcome our four speakers. How are you today, guys? Well, it's a pleasure here. It's a pleasure to be here with you and all other panelists. Great, great. I'm glad that everybody is doing well. So today we're here to share a bit more about your inspiring experiences. And I'm sure that in the audience, some are curious to understand how you landed in your industry. So let me ask you this. How did you get involved in the mobility sector? And what's driving your motivation? I'd like to start with Bhuvanesh. What's your story? Okay, Fred. Yeah, thank you for that short introduction and uh, thanks for IRF for this uh, entire session. So quickly, just to uh, roll back a couple of years. So I graduated as a mechanical engineer, but it's purely by chance that I stumbled upon an opportunity to become a collision investigator. So looking at crashes and uh, making sense of what went wrong, trying to help people make proper decisions. So that was uh, quite very, uh, it sounded very appealing to me because as a road user, I was able to see the scale of problems that I face uh, going out on the roads every other day. So I was able to relate to that scope and I was able to vividly see that not many people uh, were actually working on to improve the situation. And when I started working, I realized road safety was still not uh, being taken up uh, on a very serious account back then. So that's uh, one decision that I took up. Uh, even though I had another opportunity from another IT company. So I was uh, happy to take this up. Looking back, I think I personally had made a good choice. Uh, in the last few years, I've been able to be part of a very young team in setting up a crash database for India and uh, setting up five different branches all across India, looking at uh, uh, a different type of crashes and making sense out of it and being able to help the police, the local authorities, the highway engineers, uh, try to understand what's actually happening. Uh, why do these crashes happen? What can they do about it? And, uh, and I, I'm also happy to share that uh, in all these years, we've also seen a quite a bit, quite a tremendous amount of reduction in fatalities in a, a specific uh, uh, expressway that we've been closely involved in. So I think it's been quite satisfying over the years and I think I've made the right choice. So that's a brief about my, uh, you know, background. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. And indeed, uh, the crash investigation is a very up-to-date topic and exciting one. Um, I'd like to move on to Jose now. Well, Jose, from Colombia to Europe, what a journey. Tell us more about it. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I was working in Colombia as a, as a civil engineer, but I was really curious with the technology that uh, Europe, in, Europe, in Europe has been developed. And I moved here to study my Master of Science focalized in the area of transportation systems. Then I, I, I'm currently working in different European funded, funded projects to, to solve these issues that you, you said before, that in terms of congestion, accidents, then I'm working uh, to provide different innovative ideas and solutions for ITS systems. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. So. I know that you are our innovator of today. Um, so our last speaker of today, so Fahim, you have a quite an impressive academic background. Can you please share a bit about it? Oh, yes. So uh, I was initially a hardcore civil engineer who only knew one way of development. That's like just build, build, build. However, when I started working on an infrastructure development project back in 2015, like I soon realized that the present problems in the transportation system cannot be solved by just mere construction and expansion of the transportation network. There's a need to move towards a more sustainable transportation system. Then I got the opportunity to model the transport emissions in Newcastle over a horizon from 2010 to 2050 and evaluate them with the targets that were set out both internationally by United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and nationally by the British government through Climate Change Act. The results clearly demonstrated that unless a sustainable major shift in the transportation system is not achieved, the emission reduction and the road safety targets will not be achieved. We won't be even able to achieve 40%, 40% 
40 percent of the tar target that have been set out. Then we modeled some real life uh, effects of transportation emissions and road safety during a collaborative research project back in India. So I had a choice basically to sit back and do nothing or work in the sector. Now I'm a researcher and working on smart mobility and on the development of a, a real time, a real time dynamic road safety model, which can predict the safety in real time in a matter of milliseconds for a particular road infrastructure network. We believe that the work that we are doing at present in our research group here at Northumbria University will be a significant advancement in the road safety technology, investigation and promotion of both green as well as smart mobility. And my, mo my, my, motivation, my motivation comes from a quote, as a road safety professional, you will save many more lives than a doctor does. The hmm. only difference being that you will never meet the people whose life have been saved by working to improve the transportation system through a greener and safe transportation system, we are improving the quality of life of the general masses. Thank you, Frederick. Well, thank you, Fahim. Uh, I like this quote that you save more people than a doctor. And there is another one that saves a lot of life and unfortunately was not able to join us today. Um, it is um, Abroqua. So Abroqua is an entrepreneur that tries to raise the education um, for children in Ghana regarding road safety. And, uh, and I think that it's worth it to, to have a chat with him and to look at what he's doing because it's also really impactful for the road safety. Uh, well, thank you for, for sharing your, your, different, uh, your different inspiring path. And I'm sure that some of the audience would like to, 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 to follow your journey. So I'd like to know a bit more about what does your job mean concretely? So let me ask you this, what's the impact that you make with your position? And what is the advice that you can give to the young professional attending this conference today that are looking at your domain of expertise? Jose, perhaps you, you have some insights to share with us. Uh, right, so, uh, we are working integrated in the uh, integrate, integrating sensors uh, through the different pilots we, that we, we do uh, in Italy and and across the, the Europe, uh, we integrate different sensors in, into the roads, uh, providing, providing, trying to provide uh, different suggestions or messages to the drivers. This means that we, we provide innovation through utilizing different products or different uh, devices. And in those terms, we try to contribute for a more sustainable and integrated uh, ITS system. Thanks. Okay, well, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Jose, for, for, for sharing your, your insights. Um, Bhuvanesh, well, you're joining us from India today, um, and perhaps there, there are some Indians in the audience. So what advice can you give them? Well, um, if you ask me advice, I would rather make it as an open invitation because uh, Working as a crash investigator, one uh, for me the most uh, sort of uh, uh, eye opener was there's so much more to understand about crashes. So it's not just two people colliding, and it's not something that happens out of chance, but it's something that, in some ways, is orchestrated. So uh, trying to understand that gives you a lot of understanding of what further could be done to pro uh, to prevent such uh, such crashes from happening. And I can see this. A lot more crashes happening around the world and uh, more so specifically in the developing countries, but too few hands to work upon. So I would, I would take this as an opportunity to invite all the young minds to you know, come on board, make themselves involved. Because for one, it's most affected uh, age group is also the younger group. And at the same time, the younger population are uh, you know, more easy to grasp. They are more like white pages where you can write a lot more stuff more easily. So, I think, you know, I, I would take this platform as an open invitation for all people to, you know, for younger men, uh, personnel to come and join in. Okay. Well, thank you, Bhuvanesh. I'm sure the invitation is taken uh, amongst, the, amongst the audience. Uh, Fahim, um, what, what's the impact that you make? And, and again, any tips for the attendance of today? Oh, the work that we do is like at, at our research group, we are just developing a real-time mathematical safety models 
and which can predict safety in, uh, in milliseconds to help the street planners, infrastructure designers to make much more better informed, uh, informed decisions uh, uh, regarding the type of infrastructure that they need to put in place. And also what we aim is that we aim to provide the technology at the micro level to the professionals and as well as to the road users to make informed decisions regarding the usage of the infrastructure so, as, so that they can use the roads as safely as possible. And for the advice to the professionals, well, it, it is an interesting time to be in this profession right now. Now with the advancement in modeling capabilities, advanced technologies such as machine learning, data-driven engineering science, and advanced mathematical modeling, we are at the doorstep of the fourth industrial revolution. That's vehicle automation. Believe me, we are there. We passionate young minds have a wonderful opportunity in which we can not only be the change, but also drive the change. And we should play our role in making transportation system more sustainable in whatever capacity we are working. In the words of our from former prime minister, Theresa May, we have to be the first generation which has to leave the natural as as well as the built environment in a much better state than we found it. And this can only be achieved through our work only. Let's work together to make this world a better place. Let's work together for safer roads. Let's work together to reclaim our streets. Thank you, Patrick. Well, um, thank you, Fahim. I think these are very wise words and powerful ones as well. So we have a few minutes left. Um, I'd like each one of you to share in a very briefly in 30 seconds, uh, is there a particular dream or ultimate objective that you would like to reach in your, uh, in your journey, in your career? And perhaps we can start with Fahim. Well, for me, my dream is that right now you're using Google Maps uh, for making decisions regarding your mode of travel, regarding the infrastructure. My dream is to make, to help to, so that, uh, to help the advancement in the technology so that you can make informed decisions similar to Google Maps on your smartphones regarding the safest route to travel, regarding the safest mode of infrastructure, and also for the designers and the planners at the, at the, at the, at the micro level to help them make informed decisions. And this technology should not be only limited to the developed world. It should go to the developing countries so that these, the technology or the effort and the work that we are doing is able to make real impact and is able to save lives so that we sit uh, uh, after 10 or 15 years and we quantify, okay, this is the technology that came from our research group and this has saved this many lives. This has made transportation smarter by this much. This has made transportation greener by this much. I think that's what I would love the world to be in the next 10 or 15 years. Technology for everybody. That's a great point. Bhuvanesh, tell us more. Your dream. Bhuvanesh, you're on mute. Yeah. Now I'm audible? Yes. Right. So uh, for me, the motivation or rather uh, what I'd like to accomplish for one would be to be able to uh, bring in a perspective that, uh, you know, accidents can be prevented, not just uh, something that happens by chance. So that, that's one thing. But I understand that's something that's uh, more ambitious than it actually sounds. But uh, more importantly, and in, in in uh, walking towards that, another thing that I would like to see is, uh, like I previously said, road safety or uh, addressing the fatalities is not just one man's job. It involves just not collision investigators, but it involves uh, people like Fahim, uh, people like Abrokwa looking into uh, training and also Jose coming into talking about innovation. So it's multi-sectoral uh, approach and uh, all these people working in different directions may not yield better results, but what I'd like to see is to bring all of them together uh, to be able to march towards that uh, you know final ultimatum of uh, reduced fatalities in the developing countries so that's one thing that i would like to see thank you thank you very much bhuvanes and, and i have just noticed that Rabokwa has just joined so Rabokwa, please can you introduce uh, you uh, for for the last minute <laughs> okay um, my name is Abrokwa ivan shum um, Chief, Chief Executive Officer of Ambigain Company Limited, and I'm also a road safety advocate in Ghana. And then um, our, our mission is to help uh, make our roads more safer and then reduce more um, accidents in the country. Thank you. Well, 
Thank you. Thank you, Abokwa, for sharing. And I'm sure that if the audience has more questions for you and also for Jose, that unfortunately we were not able to, to uh, listen to about his dream, but it's time now to close this panel. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for your participation. And Gonzalo, over to you. Okay. It's an honor. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Frederic, uh, for, for leading this panel and, and for your presentation as well. Um, thanks, Bhuvanesh, Jose, Fahim, and, and finally, Abogwa. I, I'm glad that you managed to connect, even, even at, the, at the latest when we were ending, but at least we, we could see who you are and, and at least present yourself quickly. So now we are reaching the, the last part of the event. Uh, I hope uh, uh, the event so far you like it. Uh, so now we are going to hear more from, from the colleagues that had founded and lead their own companies and some initiatives that uh, help startups to grow, to, to reach the market. So kicking off, we have uh, Gregory, who is the managing director of the European Startup Prize for Mobility, uh, which is the biggest UE, uh, European acceleration program for sustainable mobility. Gregory is also a startup advisor in public affairs after having advised green politicians for over 10 years. So Gregory, the, the floor is yours. My name is Gregory Merley and uh, I'm the managing director of the European Startup Prize for Mobility. Uh, I'm very happy to share with you how we created uh, our organization. And uh, to give you a little bit of uh, storytelling, uh, Five years ago, I was still a, a political advisor for a green politician, uh, the chairwoman on, of the Committee on Transport at the European Parliament, and uh, I, took, uh, I took my boss to a pitch session. Uh, she had never seen a startup in her life, and she looked at me with bright eyes, telling me, look, those young people, they are so am amazing, so inspiring, they are the real politicians here. And it was also my belief that, uh, best ideas and real change will come from the innovation world. Uh, so still, it's a business sector, uh, but you feel the drive of uh, startup entrepreneurs. The, the, the drive is to have a positive impact, to tackle climate change, um, to have more social inclusion, uh, to tackle road safety, etc., etc. So this is, uh, this is uh, how and where uh, my, interest, my interest grew for the, for the tech world. And um, um, when it comes to the tech world, let's step into the, the innovation world uh, I want to talk about. We are, we are not only talking about startups. I have a confession to make, but I was also a long time ago a terrible startup entrepreneur myself. And uh, the conclusion to it is that uh, if I cannot be the maker who makes innovation, maybe I can be around those who knew how to do. Uh, so, so this is what I'm trying to do with this uh, acceleration program. My second piece of advice is uh, uh, forget everything you've learned at school and uh, everything you know, because startups have a very original business model. Um, the, deal, the deal flow is different. They have a lot of cash burn in the beginning when they start. Uh, they must rely on uh, uh, financial institutions that are also very original. So because of this, there is a very original ecosystem that is gravitating around startups. Uh, not to mention uh, incubators, uh, accelerators, co-working spaces, etc., etc. Uh, so very new stakeholders, uh, to summarize. Uh, my third remark is that uh, um, European innovation is not like the US or Israel uh, in terms, for example, of, unicers, of unicorns or millions raised uh, per capita. European innovation looks more like the German economy, like it's just a, a solid block of SMEs. And, and last feedback to, to, to draw the picture, Europe is a very complex playground for, um, a very complex playground for startups to grow their business. So here stands our organization, uh, a new open acceleration and investment program supporting sustainable mobility startups in Europe. And interesting enough, you have Techstars who will talk uh, in a few minutes and you will better also understand the difference between an acceleration program 
and an accelerator as they define themselves. So, uh, I hope I'm not making any mistakes, uh, Martin, but uh, you, you'll see afterwards. Um, so I will, um, sorry for the long intro, but I will now share my experience about building a program that really tries to be useful for the startups because we know that there is an inflation of labs and mentoring programs for startups and startups have limited resources to apply for those. So I really, I really try to stretch my mind about how to be helpful um, with startups. And the last thing is that this program is now very much up to date with the whole COVID situation that we are facing. Um, just to give you an example, we are no longer do what we used to do before COVID. We used to do in real life mentoring. We used to do networking events across Europe. Uh, we used to go uh, to a lot of tech events. It's no longer possible for just reasons. So we, ha we had to reinvent ourselves. So that's what we saw that maintaining and relaunching investment would be the best fit for our startups. Um, so, uh, just to summarize, so my feedback is that there is room to create organizations that help startups, really. Uh, our example is being a non-profit organization. We provide all these, service, these services for free. In our organization, uh, we provide investment for, 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 for example, but there is no counterpart. Start, startups are not bound to us. There is no success fee in case of investment. And this is very important for us. So I really think that this is a model that you, you, where you can find some inspiration and maybe re replicate in your, uh, in your region. Um, so I will, I will be a, a lot shorter uh, with the next slides, but it's just to give you more concrete example about what we do. So when I, when I say that we are uh, EU funded acceleration and investment program, um, imagine that we are a yearly program. The first six months are devoted to select the best startups in Europe and the more sustainable. So we set up uh, a startup challenge for two months. And then uh, we have a team of evaluators. Uh, this year, there were 52 independent evaluators who select, um, who screened uh, more, uh, 550 startups in order to have a top 50 and eventually a top 10. So it took us six months to do that. If you have a very solid um, uh, process, a selection process, if you want to make it very robust and valuable, it takes a lot of time. And then uh, the second part of the program is to uh, make uh, our best startups benefit from different opportunities. So here on the slide, you see, we give them visibility, investment opportunities, scale up opportunities. We advocate on behalf of the whole of our own um, innovation ecosystem. And we provide to them uh, top business and legal mentoring, uh, at least for, uh, for those who are the very top winners of our prize. Um, so what do you need to do what we do? Uh, it's simple and complicated at the, at the meantime. You need a, a community of startups. You need a critical mass. So after three years, after three years, uh, our ecosystem relies on our community of 1,500 startups. We address mobility at large. Uh, we have between 500 and 600 startups applying to our price every year. And thanks to that, uh, we managed to have an ecosystem of partners, both private and public. Um, uh, we managed to attract private partners because we give them somehow access to some collective intelligence. We give them access to um, trends in innovation. Um, because when you have a sample of 600 startups every year, that are under the radar, that are new, that are, the, it's, it, it gives you intelligence uh, that is very valuable for our partners. And also we have public partners too. So uh, typically uh, our partners are EU bodies and EU bodies who are dealing with EU fundings. 
And they value very much the quality of our ranking because we are a little bit like a rating agency. We, uh, we, give, uh, we give ranks to the startups who apply to our program. And, and they, they value very much our capacity to connect startups to their programs. So, uh, so this is how you grow an ecosystem. You have the startups and then you have a lot of stakeholders around that can help, that can help you. Um, then, talking about investment, I think it's very important uh, that uh, you understand that you can play in the investment field without being an investor yourself. So, we are not investors. Uh, we are uh, what we call ourselves a one-stop shop to EU funding. Um, it means that we make partnerships with investors and we scout for them uh, we, we scout them startups. Um, we, uh, uh, let, let, let me put it this way. We, our job is to facilitate. Startups only apply once uh, to our program and it takes them on a fast track to investment. So they apply once in our case and are screened by the European Investment Bank. The, if you're familiar with those, with those guys, the uh, EU funded uh, accelerators such as EIT No Energy and EIT Urban Mobility. And also we have our own demo day. So it's a showcase in front of investors that, that attract uh, uh, more than, uh, so, so this year we had 130 investor and it was the first time we reached such a high level of uh, a high number of investors for our demo day. Um, all the things that we do and that I hope will uh, inspire too. Uh, we do advocacy. So this is one of the achievements I'm the most uh, proud of. We, we, we managed to structure and raise up the voice of the European startups. So it took us a three months design thinking process and the contribution of 400 startups. Uh, to uh, deliver a manifesto, what we call the European Mobility Startup Manifesto. Um, and in this manifesto, uh, startups uh, managed to provide us with ideas and solutions that EU could implement easily uh, to make uh, the European Union a better place for startups. So um, uh, maybe very quickly, uh, 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 we, we, we delivered like a very uh, a key topic such as funding. There was a, a big consensus about having a more tailored funding schemes for startups. There was consensus about having public authorities who enable experimentation uh, on their ground. There was a need, uh, there, were, uh, yeah, there, there was a need for better startups representation at uh, European level. Uh, so those are the kind of key topics. I really encourage you to have a look to our website and see the, what the manifesto is all about because I guess it could be interesting for other uh, region as well. So uh, this is the end of my presentation. Um, why am I telling you all this? Uh, it's, uh, um, I think this model works. I don't know if it's a success story. Uh, I think this model works. It helps startups. It can be re replicated in other parts of the world. You need, you need a lot of partners. You need to create an ecosystem, which is probably the hardest part of the job. But then uh, uh, nothing impossible to, uh, uh, to those who want to, to, who want to change the world. Thanks you, thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Gregory, for your presentation. Uh, much, much appreciated. And I'm moving now to our next speaker, which is uh, Maya. She is a co-founder and, and CEO of Humanizing Autonomy, uh, building a global standard for how uh, automated vehicles interact with people. And Maya is a human experience designer, architect, and engineer. Uh, help me welcome Maya to our virtual stage. So Maya, floor is yours. Thanks, Gonzalo. Um, I will share my screen, one second. Brilliant. So I'm really glad to be here and to tell you a bit more about our journey at Humanizing Autonomy. 
as um, you know, you Gonzalo mentioned in the um, in the introduction, we're building a global standard for human machine interactions, and this is really you know the thrive of developing this global standard of building technology with human with people in mind is really what led me on my journey uh, to entrepreneurship and my journey to building humanizing autonomy. I am a, an architect, um, a human experience designer, a design engineer, so very, very unusual backgrounds, I believe, um, that then you know, let me start an AI company. And, and what really drive this is the need, the, the, the seeing the need um, for a much more human involvement in the development of artificial intelligence. My two co-founders um, and I met at Imperial College London about three, now almost four years ago, actually. And we were all puzzled by the fact that back in 2016, 2017, no one was talking about people when mentioning autonomous vehicles, automated technologies, urban mobility. It was all about technological innovation and a certain expectation or hope that this will so solve all the biggest challenges. We were always convinced that this is not the way to go. And I believe we have been proven right over the last few years. You know, um, the human interaction between people and machines is their key topic or the key barrier almost to allow automated technologies, automated vehicles to actually be introduced in urban environments, to allow machines and supply chain robotics really interact with people um, and kind of across the wider robotics field. So, Essentially, this is what we are focusing on with humanizing autonomy, building predictive AI, building a technology solution that is able to capture the full range of human behaviors into an intent prediction engine that is able to add value across the mobility ecosystem. This means that technology, our AI software, provides real-time intent predictions on the edge, running on really low power processors. And with that, we've made it really easy to deploy us, to integrate us across mobility systems. That can be a road cell infrastructure, a CCTV camera on a, on a road crossing. That can be a dash cam in any car, a driver system systems, all the way up to delivery robots, autonomous vehicles, manufacturing robots, and so on. And what really drives this is the strong need and strong urge of, of, of making our cities better and actually having a say and having a um, um, a voice really in developing um, robotic technologies and making sure that they create better interactions between people and um, machines, but also just we have a great opportunity here of redefining how our cities work, of redefining how cities will be in the future. Um, and then it's, it's uh, what drives me as an entrepreneur, but also I believe uh, drives a lot of other artificial intelligence and, and you know, others, yeah. Uh, young leaders in the space is to make sure that we create a place that we actually enjoy being in. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge. So, and as, as, as Gregory mentioned just earlier, it's really all about building an ecosystem. With humanizing autonomy, we're building our own category, meaning we engage with a wide a variety of stakeholders in the mobility space, in the wider smart city space, in the public authority, regulatory environment, and so on. It's all about creating a receptive environment, allow us to really accelerate deployment of our technologies. And as I mentioned in the introduction, it is really around enabling automation at scale, but not in enabling automation by all means, at all costs. It's really improving the safety, improving the experience for people when interacting with machines. By using our technology in, for instance, uh, camera devices like CCTV or dash cams or automated vehicle stacks, we're able to, for instance, really reduce accidents. And we've heard um, you know, a, a lot of, of cases and, and presentations today around the huge challenge that road safety, road accidents are. By providing human intent predictions into a variety of mobility systems, we're actually able to reduce accidents significantly. But at the same time, while increasing the safety for people, it's also about increasing the progress of mobility systems when driving, when operating in urban environments. So better decision making, being able to really predict whether someone is crossing the street, whether someone's at risk or not, whether someone's aware, distracted, many, many other things, allows the system to be more efficient and to be faster when operating around people. And then 
creating a better distinct customer experience, creating a smooth experience when driving through, let's say, central London, um, where there's a lot, a lot of people walking through the streets every day, or um, a, a, a manufacturing floor, for instance, where people and machines need to have a, you know, a pleasant and good interaction. This is where smoothness comes in. And ultimately, that's something where you know we're European at our core, and um, um, when it comes to also ethically compliant data, compliant deployment of technology, making sure that we value privacy, that we're ethical in the way we build artificial intelligence, in the way we engage in artificial intelligence and ethics frameworks, in the way we never track people as part of our analysis, and that's something that's really really important, and this really is what relates. Um, metrics about actually being able to have proven in the world and we are deployed in many vehicles today we're deployed in many devices and being able to actually do our share in preventing accidents but also being able to promote um, advancement of safe human-centered artificial intelligence I gave you a couple you know sentences about my own background you know uh, an architect turned AI engineer um, and it's just, I call it interdisciplinarity, or you can call it weirdness of backgrounds, which I think makes our mission and, dri um, and drives our company forward. You know, we're a team of 30 people today, and we all come, came together looking and, and valuing the same vision, being that global standard for human machine interactions and bringing our respective expertise when it comes to road safety, behavioral psychology, um, um, robotic path planning, policy making, product engineering all of this together in order to create safe and, and human-centered artificial intelligence technology, but also we have brought it all the way to now actually being deployed in vehicles and devices. Um, thank you very much, I'll stop here. Um, any questions, let me know and feel free to reach out if you want to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Maya. I appreciate your presentation. It's, thank you. it's a very nice job you're doing. So. Looking forward to see your progress over the years. Let me just move forward with uh, our schedule. I know we are getting a little bit late on the timing, so uh, I, I will ask some questions. Uh, we will use a little bit 10 to 15 minutes more than what was supposed to happen in the agenda, but uh, it worth. So the speakers are coming at, at really worth. So moving forward, let me introduce Martin. He is a managing director at Techstars and runs the Techstars Smart Mobility Accelerator in Turin in Italy. During his career, he co-founded four companies across different diverse uh, industries where he served as CEO, CFO, COO positions. And before becoming an entrepreneur, he spent several years in mergers and acquisitions. So Martin, now uh, the floor is, is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Gonzalo. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, despite being out of the range, uh, which we were talking about at the beginning, so I'm not that young anymore, um, and uh, thanks for the great introduction. So, yeah, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, just, uh, okay. Gonzalo, can you see my screen, please? Yes, yes, maybe if you click on present, it will go. Okay, nice. Yeah, welcome. So, um, a few words about uh, Techstars before I move into uh, my uh, career, my story, Gonzalo asked me to talk about how I got into entrepreneurship and into mobility. Let me first uh, give you a few words about uh, Techstars. So what we do as Techstars, as, uh, as Techstars Smart Mobility in Turin, Italy. Um, so we started in 2006 uh, with a simple idea connecting entrepreneurs and uh, with, with, with investors, with uh, corporates, with uh, uh, different uh, stakeholders we heard today in many presentations already networking is key building relationships very important and uh, this didn't change right so today our mission is still to make innovation accessible to everyone everywhere by connecting our companies uh, startups we have in our ecosystem to investors to corporates to cities uh, to create a more sustainable and inclusive world <clears throat> Um, and how do we do that? So um, I will talk about my part um, as uh, the managing director of the Smart Mobility Program. And uh, this is uh, one part of our offering. We have uh, many other offerings around the world. You might have heard of uh, Startup Weekend, Startup Weeks, where we will try to empower people to start companies, uh, creating an ecosystem for entrepreneurs and uh, create companies in every corner of the world. So not only Silicon Valley, but we will really try to be very 
global, and I will show you in a second the map um, <clears throat> our activities. So we we have our community programs. We have different uh, toolkits on the website where you can just go and uh, learn about how to build a company. Of course, our programs. I have two portfolio companies today with me, Jordan and Evgeny. We'll, we'll talk about their experience, and we try to invest uh, as an early stage investor very early in those companies and. Uh, hopefully uh, be part and, and the shareholder and until IPO or even exit. Um, yeah, we are truly global. So these are locations from either our accelerators, but also Startup Week and Startups Weeks we have been running over the last years. We run yearly uh, thousands of events. Um, even now during COVID, we have Startup Week and Startup Weeks, which are happening online. So if you haven't joined one, please do that. Fantastic and uh, great experience for those who are interested in, in entrepreneurship and, and building companies. Um, uh, let me give you a few words about the, the programs itself. So we are currently investing in roughly 500 early stage companies uh, across the globe who are joining us um, for a program of three months and uh, each company receives uh, $120,000 and we help them with our network, with our mentors, with our advice and know-how to create a sustainable and hopefully successful company. Um, so a few numbers. Um, to date, we run more than 200 accelerators. Our companies are now worth more than uh, 29 billion, raised more than 10 billion in funding, and um, we are the number one investor by volume per crunch base. So um, <clears throat> this is the number of uh, programs we are investing in. Uh, we have now roughly 46 uh, programs running globally, it means we invest in 460 companies. With the early stage ticket, we can also do follow on rounds and indicated companies. And we have now more than 2,200 companies in the portfolio globally. And the number, which is probably very important as well, more than 250 companies have been acquired um, from our portfolio. Um, this is the power. I mean, we heard network, very important. And uh, our funding is definitely important as well for startups. But what is way more important is the the power of the network we are providing, right? So we have plenty of investors who are working with our startups. We have more than 10,000 global mentors who are supporting uh, entrepreneurs along the journey. We have more than 100 corporate partners um, uh, in our programs. Uh, for example, in my case, we are working with three large organizations in Italy, in Tisa San Paolo Innovation Center, which is Italy's largest bank and two large foundations. Um, we have more than 1,500 of those programs, which I was talking about, empowering um, ecosystems through entrepreneurial education. And uh, a few words about my program here in, in Italy. So in my background, this is our location. So we run the program um, starting in January for three months. We are looking for 12 startups. So if you are one of those, or interested in joining us, we still have applications open until October 11th for the next batch. Uh, we invest in the companies $120,000 each. You get access to our global network, to the corporate partner network, and to our mentors, but also uh, to perks which are provided by large uh, corporate partners like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, now worth more than 5 million USD. This is our beautiful location and in Turin. And, um, Again, like uh, one very important aspect, we, we see uh, network is, is something which is important. Ecosystem is important thing. When you consider joining us in Turin, we have a wonderful ecosystem, which is uh, supporting startups, not only from our side as tech stars, but also from large corporate partners like FCA, um, Fundazione CRT, Intesa San Paolo. So those are um, partners in the program who are looking, working with, with startups and uh, different partnerships, like for example, Torino City Lab, which allows startups to test their solutions very early on. We have 35 kilometers of autonomous roads where you can test your solutions from day one. We have drone testing environments. We have investors, we have VCs uh, sitting actually like five meters away from me. Uh, so there is a huge ecosystem uh, yeah, being created in, in the last uh, 12 months since we joined the program, but this is just the beginning and uh, way more interesting initiatives and um, stories will, will come in the future. Uh, again, like one overview here, I know we will share the recording later, so I won't bore you. We invest 120,000 with a convertible note plus an equity investment. And we have an equity back guarantee, which is very important because if you're not happy with the program, with our value, you can ask your equity back. Um, and yeah, these are the corporate partners I mentioned here who are providing perks if you're one of them, AWS, Dentist, Cooley, Microsoft. So you get access to, to really fantastic companies and uh, fantastic value when you, when you join the program. Uh, Gregory talked about the difference. Um, I think we are in a very similar field. So our mission is really empower entrepreneurs, help founders to be successful, do more faster and create uh, companies with our help and with uh, the network which we are providing. 
Um, yeah, so um, Gonzalo introduced me already a few words, how I got uh, into this crazy startup life. Um, started in economics in, in Germany. Originally, you see in my name, it's, it's Polish. So I, I came from Poland, uh, started uh, studying, working in a uh, few large companies, quickly realized nine to five is nothing I want to do for my life. And uh, I got into investment banking. So I worked in um, mergers and acquisitions for heavy automotive companies, uh, mechanical engineering companies, mid-market transactions globally. And then I moved into a very tech driven environment to a company in Berlin, which was advising purely um, technology companies on uh, large transactions. And uh, one day I realized, hey, um, why don't you start finally something by yourself? This was always my dream. And um, what I did is um, taking an idea. I was never super creative. So I took um, what I learned over five, six years in investment banking. And I started an investment bank in Asia uh, where I worked with early stage companies, helping them uh, either um, getting capital from, from investors or selling the businesses. And um, we also heard today um, what is important as an entrepreneur. So if you, if you are open-minded, if you, if you always look around and uh, are very, um, yeah, uh, open to new ideas, to new contacts, building relationships. Um, actually, one of my first clients uh, was a founder who started actually a software company and uh, I helped him raising a seed round. We uh, started working together. So I joined the company as a co-founder, software business, something very far from what I did the, the years before, um, which was a company providing software service solutions for uh, pharma life science companies. I, I've been there for a few years as CFO, CEO. We sold the company successfully. I created two other businesses, call it luck. Um, and uh, one of them um, failed, uh, the other one successful. So many learnings across different industries, offline and, and offline and online and tech companies, which were funded by investors. Two of them got venture capital funding. Again, one of them failed. So many learnings. And I think someone said in one presentations. Uh, like try, fail, learn, and try again can just encourage you to do that. Um, I mean, you have so many supportive organizations like uh, Gregory and, and many other people who are really supporting founders in every corner of the world, including us, of course. Uh, so try it, uh, do it. Then uh, what I did next is I joined as a, an investor at Techstars in Berlin and Amsterdam. So Berlin was more focused on hospitality. Again, a different market I've been a part of the years before. Uh, before moving to Amsterdam and, and taking over the program for Smart City. And uh, when we look at the Smart City, mobility is a huge and important part of it. So I uh, got the opportunity to run the program in Turin, which is focused on smart mobility. And uh, how did I get into this entrepreneurship? I mean, you saw that in the slide before. It was what I thought when I started my company is like, hey, you start from A and uh, you have success at the end, but <clears throat> at the end, uh, there are so many journeys and different ways to, to create a company or to create many companies nowadays, right? You need a computer, you need a phone. Um, like there are so many digital businesses, so it's really easy uh, to create a company. In the end, I ended up um, yeah, starting in four companies, investing now in more than 50 startups globally. Um, so you never know where you go, where you end up. So be open-minded, um, take the journey as it is. It's a very exciting one. <clears throat> Sorry, I had too many calls today already. And uh, you will have fun. I mean, enjoy yourself. And uh, again, uh, this is a journey which uh, I can highly encourage you to do. Uh, there are different organizations who you can reach out to, either being early stage or later stage. Uh, investors are willing to support their mentors. There are people who really want to give back and uh, support uh, fellow entrepreneurs. And a similar journey here. Um, how did I get into mobility? So started in automotive M&A in 2009. Uh, then moved into many different markets, e-commerce, fintech, life science, hospitality, created these four companies, um, lived in many countries, in Asia, in Germany. Um, and uh, yeah, at the end, uh, I came back, so they're closing the loop. But uh, what is different, uh, when I started my career, we advised companies with uh, 1.5, 2 billion uh, euro USD transactions, uh, either going to IPO or, or being sold. Um, I'm now moved into this early stage cycle after running the program in Amsterdam at Smart City, very focused on, on smart mobility and helping entrepreneurs with our network know-how and uh, funding to create companies and to enjoy this uh, journey of being a founder. This is it. Uh, happy to connect. If you have any questions, if you're creating a startup, and looking for funding, looking to discuss uh, your idea or 
anything else, reach out to me on LinkedIn, please. And uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me, Gonzalo. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for being here with us. Um, I will move now with, uh, with the last two, two speakers of, the, of today's event. And um, let me just share again my screen. Uh, here we have, uh, so we have now uh, Evgeny. He's a, he's a CEO and founder of Shiva.aa. Prior to that, Evgeny was, has served as a senior data scientist at the American Institute for Research, leading several multi-million US federal grants and contracts. He also serves as U.S. national expert on ISO Technical Committee on Intelligent Transport Systems. So please uh, help me welcome Evgeny to, to the stage. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. I appreciate this uh, opportunity and the introduction. Um, Dito to Martin first. Do I apply to Techstar Smart Mobility? That's a great program. Uh, I'm going to just advertise that a little bit more because we come from this and we did have the best experience possible. So do, do I apply there. Um, I'm, I'm going to share some slides and I hope you see those on the screen. Um, this is a little bit more about the company that we're working on, uh, which uh, is a smart mobility and connected vehicle enterprise. Um, however, I would start by saying that uh, this is my first company, so I'm a first time entrepreneur. Um, and uh, what's a little bit very important there is uh, when you listen to presentations uh, from accelerators, from, uh, from investors, from VCs, then um, you understand what they mean after you actually go through the experience many times. So it really takes a journey uh, to get to understand how entrepreneurship works. Um, and then after you go through that journey, you understand why certain things are the way they are. Uh, while it's very difficult to get it somehow from just reading books or going to the to the university to school, uh, it's very important to actually practically go through this journey to learn and to understand how it all works and appreciate every moment of that. So uh, let me just tell you a couple words about what we work on and then uh, I can go ahead and uh, tell a little bit more about uh, the founder experience. So we are working on creating uh, the connected vehicle platform mostly focused on vehicle based payments. Um, and uh, the focus here is to automate the entire driving experience. So no more meters, no more toll booths, no more credit cards, no more even pay by phone parking apps or whatever other apps, the vehicle just pays for itself. So this is a hot market that is really growing today. Uh, multiple FinTech um, uh, enterprises as well as OEMs are working on these types of issues. So what we have here is a patented telematics platform that uses precise car location to automate payments and also to provide you precise navigation instructions. So if you're low on fuel, uh, we can real time tell you, okay, go to that nearest gas station on the way to your office so that you don't even need to think about it. We're gonna reroute you automatically. When you arrive there, you just stop at the gas pump, you fill up the tank and you go. Everything is automated in terms of payment. Um, the most interesting part as well, a lesson learned uh, is, Entrepreneurship is all about sales. It's not about product. It's not about being very smart. It's not about really uh, getting everything really cool. Uh, entrepreneurs all, are usually very much married to their product. It's your baby, right? But in the end, if the market doesn't need it, there is no enterprise, there is no company and you have to shut it down really. Uh, so uh, when the market accepts things, uh, and that's what you see here on this slide, customer driven use cases. So many things of what we've done, we started with parking only, but then we had customers coming to us and saying, okay, can you also automate fuel payments? Uh, can you also think about drive through payments? So this is how the enterprise can develop because then you find the value rather than the product itself. That is the key uh, criterion of success. Uh, this is just one example because I think it will be relevant from the smart city perspective at IRF uh, panel here, uh, real-time traffic and transit data. So our high precision uh, GNSS geopositioning solution can provide information into the traffic control center, uh, which is superior because it's real time, because it's highly accurate. Uh, and then it can provide in the end, uh, more important navigation instructions to the driver so that you can actually correct uh, uh, and make it more of a system optimum versus the personal optimum uh, in the, in the uh, smart city management. Another uh, example or use case is parking, uh, which we implemented in New York, as well as uh, looking to work with uh, various cities in Europe now. So you just find, park and you walk away. Everything is figured out for you. Uh, the vehicle pays for itself. And then when you leave, it just uh, sends you the receipt. 
the bigger one obviously is in car payments. Uh, so we're doing the full point of sale cloud platform integration, which is a digital wallet. Uh, Italians, I guess, uh, will appreciate this being called Satispay for cars. This is exactly what we're trying to do here as Satispay is already a big platform out there in Italy uh, that uses mobile uh, phones as a platform for payments. Now we're trying to do the same, but for the vehicles, for the connected vehicles. Uh, the technology itself is uh, the key advantage here is that much more accurate than smartphones and standard GPS, which is what allows for these transactions to be reliable and secure. Um, a little bit about myself uh, which and the team. So right now we're about 10 people. Um, and uh, we are really coming from the smart transportation, data science, um, and uh, government world, public policy world, as well as engineering. So this is very good uh, team in terms of solid technology and solid engineering. However, I will return again to this point that not every entrepreneur is born as a good salesman uh, or saleswoman, uh, but every entrepreneur has to learn this very fast, very quickly to be a success. Uh, finally, my last slide is obviously every one of us is thinking about COVID. So there will be a lot of things that we need to do uh, in the post-COVID normal, which include in our case, contactless payments, reduced human interaction, and really efficient fleet management because we get so many more um, out there on the roads today. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to answer and uh, appreciate this opportunity again. Thank you, Gonzalo. Thank you. Thank you, Evgeny. I uh, appreciate your presentation as well. It's always glad to, to hear these amazing ideas and, and, and I look forward to see the progress over the years. So uh, let me just introduce Jordan, which is our last speaker of today. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of uh, Automotus. Uh, prior to that, Jordan led business development uh, efforts at numerous venture-backed startups. So Jordan is connecting today from LA. So it's very early there. So we'd say thanks Jordan for, for being with us today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Gonzalo. Uh, pleasure to be joining all of you. Are you going to be sharing the screen as we walk through? Do you want me to? No, you, you go ahead. Yeah, if you can. Okay. Beautiful. All right. Well, appreciate all of your time uh, this evening. It's a pleasure to follow Evgeny there, um, as well as Martin. For some background today, I'm just going to be briefly touching on what we do here at Automotis and then diving into some of the key takeaways that I've had from starting a company, both in the mobility space as well as in the business to government space. Is, you know, they're both somewhat unique and uh, I feel that I've, I've learned quite a bit over the past few years that um, I wish I had learned earlier on, but unfortunately, in the nature of starting businesses, you learn a lot of things the hard way, which is uh, one of the best ways to learn things concretely because you sure don't forget them, but also it's, uh, it's nice to learn things the easy way if possible. But for some background, Automotis is a video analytics company that is targeting the curb. And I know the curb isn't necessarily a common uh, word in Europe, but it's really on street parking here. Um, and the reason that we're doing so is because the value of on street parking or the curb has skyrocketed in recent years, especially in urban areas due to more and more demand from commercial activity or billable actors. We've seen more freight companies on the road from growth in e-commerce driving more UPS, DHL, Amazon, FedEx trucks to uh, try to find more on-street parking to deliver packages. Until COVID, we were seeing 30, 40% year-over-year growth in ride-hailing services across Uber and Lyft, WeTaxi. And in recent months, we've seen demand from food delivery services, Postmates, DoorDash, Uber Eats skyrocket. And while it's, it's great to see this increased demand for curbside activity, this has also uh, really caused a lot of chaos in cities because first off, you're seeing conflicting needs at the curb as you know, commercial vehicles are parking for much shorter times than passenger vehicles. And then beyond that, cities currently aren't able to monetize that. And so what we've done is built out our video analytics solutions to help cities understand, monetize, and enforce all forms of curb activity. And so basically we, we integrate with existing cameras or we put up our own 
to really provide two key components to cities, one being insights and the other being automations. And so from the insights perspective, breaking down traffic and parking demand by different modes of transit. And then on the other side, automating payment and enforcement to align operations with the short-term nature of commercial parking. And for some background, we're up and running in the city of Turin, helped out on a project in Paris due to a uh, Techstar Smart Mobility Accelerator program out there. And back in the US, we're launched in a couple of cities uh, on, the West on the West Coast here, including Bellevue, Washington, and soon to be Los Angeles. But uh, going on from there, I'm happy to dive into a few of the key takeaways that I've had over the past few years in this space. You know, first off, when you're selling to government, uh, it's gonna be increasingly critical to invest in your early customers, both from a services perspective and from um, really building out those relationships because everything um, that we found going back to what Evgeny was saying is that a lot of the early assumptions you might have could be off. And so you want to really understand what the needs and the alternative value of your services might have for customers. And so really uh, diving in and giving your early customers as much um, value as possible and understanding as much as you can about their needs. And then going off of that, taking an ecosystem approach has been incredibly critical for us because there are so many different players in this space and so many different ways into different customer bases that understanding all of the different stakeholders, businesses, and really networks that, that have influence over the different customer bases in this space is, is very, very critical. And then directly aligned with that, our sales cycle is tied to our network. Depending on how well we know somebody in a particular city government or how well of an introduction we can get, that directly correlates to how long it's going to take for us to sell to that city. And so going you know, back on everything that um, we've heard today, network, 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 meet as many people as you can, build those relationships and really nurture them because that is you know, arguably the most critical thing to your success in starting any venture. And then lastly, in working with governments, if you want to actually make money, uh, you have to finish pilots with roadmaps. So it's not just about showing off your technology and then hoping they issue um, a bid, but actually providing the consulting services to show the roadmap for your customers that this is the impact at this scale. If you do this X, Y, and Z, then you'll be able to scale this impact in, in these ways. And so really working um, and handholding these early customers to show them the path to scalability. And then going off of that, um, outside of business to government, some additional takeaways just in the mobility space is, um, you know, first off, new entrance means new problems or, you know, in the entrepreneur's perspective, new opportunities, whether it's electric vehicles or dockless mobility or ride hailing, all of these trends and market forces create tons of opportunities for other companies because there's countless problems that arise with each of these different new forces, whether it's you know, what's coming next, autonomous vehicles. If you think about all of the different problems that are going to be associated with, with changes in driver behavior and changes in the market overall, there's no shortage of, of new opportunities to keep your eyes out on. Um, but in line with that, there's also you know, policies and regulations that you need to be familiar with to actually take advantage of those opportunities because this is a highly regulated space and there are a lot of different policies that you have to be familiar with, especially um, when we're talking internationally because they vary, whether it's region by region in a given nation or nation by nation internationally. Um, and then going off of that, um, one thing to be con or, you know, conscious of if you do start a, a business in this venture too, is that there are limited players. It's a fragmented space overall from what, what I've seen, but there are only so many different companies out there in each sector. And so understanding when the right time to, to get in touch with the right people is, um, is very helpful because you don't want to burn bridges and ask somebody for help early on when you don't actually have any value to add. So understanding who to reach out to and when is, is very important. And then lastly, uh, reiterating what Evgeny said, if you get the chance, join Martin and his team for the Techstar Smart Mobility Accelerator in Torino. 
it will be incredibly impactful and a, a great time. Uh, but that's really all I, I have for you all today. Uh, if you have any questions or want to talk any further, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to further discuss. Thank you, thank you, Jordan. I'm. I think we we are reaching. We we have reached uh, the end of of today. Uh, special thanks for you for being with us today. I know it's pretty early there. So I hope you you enjoyed as much as I did. Many thanks to all the 16 speakers. Uh, we were more than 200 people uh, from every corner of the world. So as as a reminder, the full recording will be available in the next dates in our webpage. Uh, and and wish you all a great day, evening, uh, and good night. So stay in touch and goodbye. That's all. Thank you.